How's everybody doing in Cebu? Kumusta mo? Mana magpamahal? Awesome. Go ahead and grab something to eat. Uh, we'll be starting what in- What are your uh, chances of lending a, a client who needs UI, UI design? Um, I think your chances, um, I think you guys are in a advantageous position based out, of, I mean, my personal opinion as far as getting a job in UI design, I think putting together uh, a really good portfolio is a good idea. Um, Putting yourself out there, trying to build a community, which we're building with this Discord, um, those kind of things are helpful. Um, but I think, I think you're in a really good position, actually, in Cebu to find some jobs like that. So that's my thinking. I, I think you still have a really good chance of of getting that kind of work. I think it's a in demand and growing area. And if you could also add, in my personal opinion, if you could add some coding skills to it as well. Um, I think that'll even expand those opportunities even farther. What do you think, Charles? What are your thoughts? Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, um, that that's true. Um, um, just UX jobs, UI UX jobs have been quite scarce even before the pandemic, um, especially in Cebu. This this around these times, um, these times have posed really a good challenge for for all of us. For I mean, for those of you who are looking to. Um, transition into UX. So I think probably this could be a good time to, like Justin said, set up your portfolio, attend webinars like this one, um, get educated in UX, um, take on some side projects if you can. Um, that way you'll have a solid portfolio to, to bring with you during your interviews. Yeah, I think there's, I think there's a balance to learning while doing stuff and then of course, doing that too much where you're not making money. But I think even in the beginning, if you have some people that have real professional projects that you could work on, even if it's for a little bit of money, sometimes those grow. And you just have to know when to start saying, okay, that's, I'm not gonna keep doing that forever. But it's sometimes a good way to start building momentum and kind of get those feelers out to other people because they'll start showing other people your work and that might lead to more and more jobs. So. Um, that's another thing that you might might want to do as well uh, to start putting you in that position and growing your network for that kind of thing. Yeah, experience equals more jobs. Exactly, Mr. Fernandez. Okay, cool. Let's let's get started here. So, um, is that? Okay. All right. You're breaking out your first screen. Perfect. All right. So yep. welcome everybody to um, our second session, an introduction to user experience research with Charles Navabos. Um, really excited to have him joining us. I think today's session is going to be amazing. And uh, I hope you guys all get a lot out of it. And uh, don't forget to follow us on Twitch, like us on um, Facebook, share with your friends and stuff like that and uh, also light up the Discord with discussions and thoughts, sharing your work, um, sharing your homeworks and things like that. Okay, welcome Charles and thank you for joining us today. All right, thanks for having me, Justin. Um, so um, how's everybody going? I know it's an early morning in Cebu. I hope everybody's had their, uh, their morning coffee and their breakfast and we're good to go. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about user experience research, and this is going to be a follow-up to um, yesterday's talk by Aaron about UX, um, the, the basics of UX and UX design, some of the UX laws. Um, so just to give you guys a little bit of overview of what to expect today. Um, so I sort of made this talk uh, to, be a, to be very beginner. To, to, to all of you who are, because um, I've been seeing um, what you guys are doing right now. You, most of you are wanting to transition into UI, UX, want to be employed in UI, UX, to do more UX projects. So this is going to be a primer um, to sort of an introduction course. Um, we're going to go through the importance of UX research, uh, when to do it, 
Um, we're going to talk about the uh, difference between qualitative versus quantitative UX research techniques. Um, and we're also going to talk about exploratory and evaluative UX research techniques. And then I'm going to leave some time for Q&A at the end of the session. Um, so if that sounds good, we're all good to go. Is everybody hearing me OK? Um, so right now, I'm staring at my PowerPoint presentation. So I might need to switch tabs just to see what's going on in Twitch. Um, but um, later on during the Q&A, just post all of your questions, um, post them there, and I'll get to them as much as I could at the end of the talk. Um, also, some housekeeping um, reminders. So the slides will be available to all of you um, after the talk. Um, most of this, most of my slides are not very text heavy, um, by the way. So you might want to listen to the recordings more because I think you'd find it more educational. Um, if you have any questions about UX research, feel free to post them on Discord uh, at the UX Research chat channel. And also, if you haven't already, please sign the attendance form um, as requested by our organizers. The link to which is found on Twitch. All right. Here we go. So hello, everybody. My name is Charles Novabos. I'm a UX researcher uh, at Fix.com. I've been a UX researcher for five years now. I worked in e-commerce, financial services, and printer development. I've applied human-centered design concepts, worked with interdisciplinary teams to create software and hardware designs. So everybody starts out um, in UX from some background, right? Many people come from a programming background, from a QA background, from a graphic design background, any background. Personally, um, my background is in industrial engineering, um, and that was where um, I was introduced to the concept of designing things, uh, products, according to human limitations and human characteristics. Um, so there's a specific um, subtopic in industrial engineering called human factors and ergonomics, and that was what I specialized on. Um, so, so that sort of gave me a good segue to transition into the world of UX. Um, so I also taught user experience and usability engineering in the graduate level um, at USJR. I taught there for about three years or so, or four years maybe, um, at the master's level. I was born and raised in Cebu City, and I've since left the country and I'm now living in Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada, where I am um, a UX researcher for Fix.com. So to tell you more about um, the company that I work for, we are Fix.com. We are a, a group of e-commerce sites, and we operate in the US and Canada. We uh, specialize in appliance parts for just about anything, any equipment you have at home. Um, air conditioners, you, you got dishwashers, refrigerators, microwaves. If stuff gets broken, um, people could, could um, purchase their spare parts from us and we ship it to them. Uh, I've worked at Fix.com for um, over a year now. And um, our company actually has a, a website and social media presence where you could see some DIY tips. Uh, you can watch videos about home improvement. Um, yeah, essentially, we try to help people save money by not having to buy brand new appliances when things get broken. So just by fixing it yourself, buying spare parts, you are good to go. So along the course of my talk, I'll be giving some examples of my work um, here at fix.com to sort of give you guys an insight into what I do as a UX researcher. All right, let's get to it. One of the most common um, statements that I hear about user user UX research, sorry, is this one. It goes, know your users, 
because you are not a user. One way I'd like to, to relate this with is if you're giving a present to a friend or to a loved one, um, you would want to know what sort of, you know, what their preferences are, you know, what their lifestyles are, what, what sort of gift would be perfect for that person, right? You would, you'd want to know, like, uh, what your favorite color is, maybe, or what things would be useful for that person. UX research um, helps us do that same thing in the way that we create websites and digital products or almost any product um, in the way that is user-friendly, that meets um, the user's expectations, the user's preferences, and just fulfills an overall um, user need. Um, another example that I could think of is um, as UX practitioners, we are essentially the representatives of our, of our users in the company. So when you come to the table with all the other teams in your company, marketing, admin, IT, sales, um, you are the voice of the customer, the voice of the user. Um, you can think of it as like being a government, an elected government official for a lack of a better example. And um, these government officials, you know, believe they know, um, you know, what the citizens need, you know, they know what we're going through. Um, so you could be that representative for your users. Um, when you come to that design table. And that's one of the biggest responsibilities of anybody doing UI and UX in a company. Because there's going to be a lot of people um, from different positions in the company who say, oh, I know more about the user than you do. Um, I'm a user myself. I'm a human being myself. So I pretty much know what to expect or you know, what a user's mind is, is going to be like. But um, these are all, in my opinion, going to be just all assumptions about users. Um, and until we do proper research, that is when we, we, we never could know what our users are, are expecting. So I like this quote, know your users because you are not the user. Let's go ahead then and talk about some definitions of UX research. Um, the term UX research can sometimes be um, said as user research. They come in different names. They could also be design research. Um, ultimately, it all boils down to that specific focus, that laser focus on the user or the customer. And it's about identifying and measuring, just um, some emphasis there on measuring, user behaviors, their needs, their goals, their preferences, and their expectations for using your products or your service. We also want to do UX research to understand the context and frequency of use of our products. When I say context, um, you begin to think about um, you know, where do people visit your website from? Are they at, um, are they at home? Are they in their office? Are they using it on a mobile app while they're driving or while they're walking? Uh, and, and how often do they, do, do they use your, your app or your service? Um, so those are things we want to sort of determine when we do UX research. UX research also touches into characterizing and segmenting users. So you, um, the demographics come into play here. So you also think about the age ranges of your users. Um, obviously, you know, there's some, some many different factors that come into play um, according to the generation that you belong. Um, and there's some, some cognitive limitations as well uh, coming from people from um, the upper segment of the age ranges. So things also like genders and, and income ranges, um, locations, places of residence. So those are things that can help you characterize 
and segment your users and get to know them better. We can also uncover pain points and roadblocks to adoption and retention through doing UX research. Um, in my second talk, um, we're going to talk about validation and evaluative UX research techniques. And that's going to uncover the struggles that um, users are going through while they're using your product and how we might be able to eliminate those roadblocks and make sure they have a seamless experience and they can achieve whatever, they, whatever it is that they want with your product or your service. Um, and also, uh, we want to enhance adoption. And what I mean by that is if you're a new user, um, how likely are you going to keep using it? Um, what's your first impression of that service or that product? And how might we be able to retain you um, to keep you with us? and keep using our product and using our service. So all of these things, um, research can help you discover that and make sure you make informed decisions um, and not basing on just pure assumptions. Um, and that's just, a, just, that's just the way to go. So I have here a, um, a little portrait of a woman. Um, and as you can see, she's doing something on a machine. Um, it appears to be a movies and games machine, but um, we could also substitute that with ATM machines. Um, so she's doing that. Um, she's pressing something on the screen. And, and just by observing this photo of this woman, um, if you're the designer of that machine, this could be a very critical snapshot for you to learn more about the context of use, um, what's going through her mind at this point, and what's going on around her. So you can think of you know, what she's thinking, what she's hearing, what she's seeing, what she's feeling as she is using your product. This picture shows that she's obviously in a very busy environment and it looks like a grocery store. Um, so that also you know, influences how, how much she's able to concentrate while using your product. So some of these things, just by observing people, um, can give you some insights and very good insights into what's going on around them. Um, and ho hopefully you'll be able to design your products better so that it works and it's still efficient for them to use despite what challenges they have in their surroundings. I also like this quote from Mike Kuniaiski, and it says, the process of understanding the impact of design on an audience, that is UX research. So, it's not just about making, um, making your product, making your website, your app, your service, attractive, aesthetic, um, cool, and modern. It's about understanding what the impact of that design is to your users. What experience are you trying to impart on that individual? Is it a positive experience? Is it a frustrating experience? Right. So. We have business goals um, in the company, and we obviously want to retain our customers. We want to keep them loyal so they keep coming back to us. So UX research can definitely help us assess what the impact is of our products to our users and to our customers. I'd like to touch on why we must do UX research. There's three things here that I'd like to highlight. One importance of doing UX research is to provide a foundation for design. In any uh, product development cycle, ideally, you'd want to do UX research first. And I'll talk a little bit more on that on the next slide. You'd want to do more UX research first before getting on to designing. Um, so UX research research can give you that foundation, that insights to help you design better 
um, so that you don't have to redo your designs as often. Um, by doing research up front, you'll be able to make sure that you're hitting uh, the right spots, you're covering everything about your users, what they really need, they expect out of your product, and that's gonna give you some insights in when you start creating your designs. And I talked to, uh, and kind of alluded to this a bit earlier, UX research can help us increase user satisfaction and continued patronage of our products and services. So once we know more about, um, about them, who they are, where they, you know, what sort of demographics they belong to, we can now sort of target the experience and handcraft that and tailor that to match those characteristics of our users. Therefore, they become more satisfied um, and then they would continue using our products and services. Finally, there's this, and I find this very critical too, is that UX research can help us influence product strategy in the company. Say by doing research, um, you have uncovered that majority of your users are mobile users as well, and they prefer to use your site on mobile. That probably as a product strategy, you might want to consider creating a mobile app for your website. Um, and that is just one, of, one example of many different ways UX research can influence product strategy in the company. So when do we do UX research? Here you can see the software development cycle. Um, it, it starts with planning. Uh, planning is where you sort of scope out your project. Um, what features do you want to include? Um, what, what are the functionalities? What are the limitations of your software? And then you move on to the second phase, which is the analysis phase. Yeah, you then um, convene as a team and say, hey, is this something we can do uh, this cycle or next cycle? We now talk about timelines um, and, and break down deliverables that everybody in the team will have to do. Then you move on to designing, which is the third, third phase. This is where wireframes come in, prototypes come in to, to sort of give, um, to make to make your ideas more tangible. And then you move on to the implementation phase, which is practically the, uh, the development phase where everything gets coded. And then go into testing and integration, make sure there are no bugs. And then you go into maintenance, which is a sixth phase. Um, and that is where you monitor for any uh, post-development bugs that might arise, what are some comments coming in from the field. So this is a typical software development cycle. Now, where do you think UX research is done in this cycle? So give it a little bit of thought. Obviously, I couldn't switch to Twitch right now to see your responses, but um, I probably would be able to read that afterwards. So the answer is you can actually do UX research throughout the whole software development cycle. It's possible to do bits and pieces of research at every, um, every phase of the cycle. That way you make sure you know, your users are represented in, I mean, when you do planning, when you do analysis, when you, when you do design, when you test, and when you maintain your products, that you, the user's voice is always represented However, I'd like to point out uh, two things, uh, two phases where UX research can be most useful, although you can use it in all of these phases. The first two phases would be critical for doing research, and that's what we call exploratory research. This is where we um, ask questions like, who will use this product or feature? Um, what user needs should be fulfilled? 
what pain points should we should we address so these kinds of questions are just exploratory right you don't know the answers to those yet and you want to know by doing research um, and this is going to help you plan and analyze and and see which features are most essential to include in your product exploratory research can also um, tell you how can we help users perform their tasks with our products more efficiently. Let's say you're doing a version two of your current product. And then by doing exploratory research, you can then see, um, okay, we have some gaps coming from our first version, some things that we haven't fulfilled, some functionalities that we have omitted. Phase two, I mean, version two would be the best time to do that. And also, what are our competitors offering? So a little bit of competitive analysis can also be crucial because um, you obviously want to know what you know your competitors are doing. Because if people are not happy using your product, they would switch to your competitors. So you what you might you would want to create that um, that that competitive advantage and. UX research, UX design is one way you can achieve that. If people are happy, if people find using your product more pleasurable than your, comp your, than your competitors, then they're more likely to be adopting your product instead of theirs. So doing research in the earlier phase of um, the earlier parts, stages in the software development cycle is what's called exploratory research. But then research is also critical at the end part of the software development cycle, especially in the testing and maintenance stages. So this is what we call evaluative research. Now, so let's say all your designs have been created, everything has been coded. Um, how are we faring now? How are we performing? How are our users liking it? Are they pretty satisfied with, with what we're offering them. So these are some questions that you might want to ask during this stage in the, in the cycle are, are users failing with their tasks? How long does it take for users to complete their tasks? Are users satisfied with their experience? Do users understand how our product works? So if you have like first time users coming in, let's say you're a brand new product, do people know and understand what value they could get from your product? What's the value proposition? And is it clear to them? How long are users staying on our site? Are they staying on one page for like three minutes? Um, is it taking them 10 full minutes to check out? So that's something we definitely want to reduce and make sure they have a speedy process um, throughout the way and hassle-free, um, a hassle-free experience. Are users coming back to us? This is a good time to reflect, hey, is our product working? Is it creating that mark in our users, in our customers? Is it implanted into their brains that, hey, when they're looking for um, appliance parts is fix.com the number one option that they can think of. How much have we made that mark into them by the experience that they've had using us the first time? And finally, would they recommend us to their friends, to their families? So I think this, this last question would be the ultimate test for your product success. Um, in terms of user experience is that if they can promote your product and share that to their friends and, 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 and family, because then you have sort of developed and instilled that trust in your brand, in your service, that you are reliable, that you can be trusted to offer that service. And now you've gained their confidence so that to me is like the ultimate metric, the ultimate success metric for anybody doing UX is that, hey, I want to come back to your site and I want to share this with my friends.
Now let's try to talk about how to do UX research. And I know this slide is a bit um, plentiful, but I'll try to walk you through the different stages, the different steps in doing UX research. First of all, I think you'll find this to be familiar somewhat. If you have done research in some capacity in the past um, at your school as a student, the, the research flow is pretty much the same. Um, so you, I imagine you'd find this very familiar. But I sort of tailored what goes into each step in the more UX um, context, the more UX research context. So let's start off by identifying the problem. Um, so you want to evaluate your product. So if you're making a version two, you want to evaluate your previous version and identify what the problems are, what are opportunities for improvement. If you are starting out, um, you're launching a new product, a brand new service, you can talk to your stakeholders, to people inside the company, to marketing, to customer service, to sales. These are people who are most likely in contact with our customers. Um, and so they should be able to give you some insights into what the top issues are that are being reported by customers at the field, what sort of things they wish that your product could have, what more features do they think they want and don't and not like. Um, so you can talk to these stakeholders and get ideas from them. In my experience, um, some of the research questions that I've had come from these stakeholders. They would come to me and say, hey, Charles, we're having, we're seeing this issue coming from the field. Um, we're seeing, like, for example, a lot of returns. Um, we, we're seeing a lot of shipping issues, which is typical for an e-commerce environment. And so um, without them coming to me uh, and, and being proactive about that, I could also talk to them and reach out um, and just examine what the top issues are that merit some research work to expound on. So here's where you can also, you know, where collaboration is key among people inside your organization. You can also identify problems by looking at your competitors. Um, what things are they doing better than you are? What things are you doing worse than they are? What things are they offering that you are not offering? So that's probably something that causes your user base to, to transfer to, to their um, user base, so you might want to look at your competitors as well. You can also review trends. What are some up and coming um, trends in technology, in, in science? Um, so I hear um, the buzzwords today are like artificial intelligence, machine learning. So how can we make use of those new technologies to sort of enhance um, the, the uh, our product and how it performs. How can we offer more features using these brand new technologies? And you also want to identify what gaps, um, um, uh, the gaps with the need of the users that you are not able to address in earlier versions of your product and look for opportunities to finally address them in your subsequent versions. So that's pretty much the first step doing um, in UX research is to identify the problem, and it starts there. Out of that problem, you now want to formulate a research question. So let's say you have a problem. Oh, we're experiencing a lot of, we're seeing a lot of users abandoning their cart. And to be honest, this is one of, our, one of the challenges that I'm facing currently as a UX researcher at FIX, one of the problems we're examining is why people are putting stuff into their cart, but then decide to just go and just exit and just leave the site. So we can formulate some quite from some, some assumptions and some hypotheses for out of that. We could say probably um, maybe they're just shopping. Maybe they were looking at other sites and see which one's cheaper. 
Um, so those are, those are just some assumptions and we want to validate um, and gather data to support or to invalidate those hypotheses to really figure out what's really happening. And this is also where you, you might want to think of how to answer or validate your own questions, your assumptions, and your hypotheses. What sort of metrics or measurements do you need to get to be able to come to a conclusion that, hey, that hypothesis was wrong, or that assumption has been myth busted? <laughs> um, so, yeah, you can think of um, what sort of metrics you need to measure down the road at this point. The third step is to prepare a research plan. Um, and this entails a lot of steps. Um, and this is something that as a UX researcher, you should be able to um, compose and think through since this is critical. If you fail to plan, you, you, you plan to fail, so they say. So this is where you select your data gathering methods and tools. What sort of methods are out there that you could use? Um, what tools, what software tools do you need to gather that data? Do you need, um, if you're, say, if you're doing a survey, for instance, and I'm, I'm going to talk about more of the tools in the following slides. Um, so if you're doing a survey, what platform are you going to use for your survey? Are you going to use SurveyMonkey or um, Google Forms? And uh, the list goes on. Um, you also want to identify who your target users are for that specific problem that you're trying to investigate. So let's say um, you're examining that cart abandonment problem. So you might want to target users um, or customers that already have parts in mind, that already have um, that buying intention, who are highly motivated to purchase, as opposed to getting people who are just meh, shopping around, seeing what's on the site, see if I find something I need. So you might want to target um, specific users to give you that data, that accurate data to answer your problem. And also, you also want to think about sample sizes. I know you, there's, it's virtually impossible to survey all of your users. If you have like 1 million users, there's no way you can survey all of them. So you have to rely on statistics and get samples. Um, typical sample sizes would be for, um, for a survey that's, that's qualitative. And I know I'm jumping ahead of my topics here. I'll, I'll um, explain what qualitative and quantitative researches are in the next slides. Um, but sample sizes could be from, a, from 5 to 20 people. Um, there's obviously some formulas that you can use as well uh, to compute for the right sample size that gives you um, the best integrity for your data. This is also a step where you could determine timelines. How quickly do you need to get this research done? What are the dependencies? So probably the design team is waiting on your findings, um, and you might have a tight schedule for development. So these are things you need to consider while doing your research plan. What are success metrics that you might want to obtain, are you going to obtain satisfaction satisfaction rates? Are you going to obtain times and tasks, uh, the success rate? So these are things that you can measure um, if you're doing a quantitative study, if you're doing a qualitative study. Um, and I know, again, I'm jumping ahead, but um, the, there are practically many su success metrics that you could use um, at your disposal to um, help you get data for your problem. Also, you want to talk about what teams should be involved in this research. Um, you might want to get insights from your marketing team or have your development team and your design team um, you know, observe as you're doing your research. You, you also involve them so that they also develop that empathy for your users. You can also set a budget if you have one 
for your company. If not, um, that's that's okay. There are free tools that you could use as well, and um, you can always you can always be creative when you perform your uh, your your research such that it doesn't have to cost that much. And then you finally recruit participants. You, you recruit your target users that you want to uh, do the research on. So these are some of the things you will need when you create your research plan. After that, you have you gather your data, you perform your experiments, you um, uh, send out your surveys, send out your interviews. Enough said. And after you have all the data, you analyze your results. You want to summarize, look for patterns. You now calculate the metrics um, and say, hey, did we answer our question? Did we invalidate or validate our hypotheses? Um, with your results, you can also compare those results to your previous versions and to um, this, the same metrics from your competitors. You can actually also do research on your competitor site. Um, there are tools that you can use there too if you want to do some testing um, or if you share the same demographic, if you share the same target users, uh, which happens a lot, you can always um, ask your opinions about other services that might be out there. And that gives you some insights into why they would prefer your service or their service. And finally, and this is very important, you have to propose recommendations based on the data that you gathered. So what, it's, what sort of improvements um, do you need to instate in your, next, in your next version? So these are recommendations that have to be concrete. You can always um, add some wireframes to that so people in your organization can visualize what you're talking about. But it's essential that you propose recommendations um, after all um, your research, after doing all your research. Finally, um, this is when you communicate your findings. You want to present your findings to your stakeholders in the company. Um, and that's going to be everybody and anybody who you think might want to hear your research um, and your findings. Um, typically, these would be the developers or the designers or people in upper management if they're interested, um, and which I think you should also try and, and coax them to, to um, attend your presentations. Um, that way, you can, you can also like promote the value of getting user insights to influence decisions in the company. Finally, you also need to guide your design teams and guide your development teams in implementing your proposals, your suggestions. So that's essentially the, uh, uh, a, a broad uh, snapshot of a UX research process. Um, and I know I talked about this a little bit, and now let's delve into that deeper. UX research methods can be classified into many different things. There's qualitative, there's quantitative, there's attitudinal, and there's behavioral methods. Just by looking at um, these terms, qualitative and quantitative, um, it bring, you should have some idea of what we're talking about. But let me give some examples. Quantitative research seeks to answer how many, how long, how much, and how often. Um, the data that you get from this type of research takes the form of numbers. So these are numerical. So you're talking about durations, like things in seconds, in minutes. Um, let's say, how, how long does it take for an average user to complete your sign-up form? How long does it take for them to check out or find an item on your site? Um, how long and um, how long does it take them to, it can also be things like how long is, uh, how long is their waiting times on your customer call center? So you can also apply ratings. Um, so these ratings can be um, 
like a scale of one to five. You can ask questions like, how easy or difficult do you find this website to be? How satisfied are you with our site? And you can assign numbers from one to five, with one being the lowest, five being the highest. And that way you can quantify the, uh, the user's um, insights and, and derive comparisons later on. They can also be in the form of percentages and statistics. Uh, so these things can be gathered through surveys, through analytics, through observations, right? So um, for instance, you're doing, um, you've invited somebody, a target user, and you're observing how they're using your website. Let's say they're signing up to create a new account, and then you just observe like how many errors, how many missteps, you can count uh, what sort of negative experiences they're, they're, um, they're facing. So you can do that by observation. There are also automated techniques to gather that, and you can rely on Google Analytics to give you that, um, that session duration or from this step to that step, how long did that take? Analytics can also give you that insight. So I have some examples here below. For instance, it takes an average user three minutes to check out. Three out of 10 or 30% of users did not click on the info button. The user thought the task was very difficult, which is four on your rating scale. So having these, well, having these um, numbers is crucial to measure the success or, or the performance of your product. We lack the why element. You know, why do they think it was very difficult? Why did it take three minutes to check out on our site? So we wanna also gather qualitative information, which seeks to answer the why and how. So this data takes the form of words as opposed to numbers, and these could be reasons, their preferences, their expectations, their pain points, the behaviors that you're observing, and their opinions. These are gathered through methods like interviews, surveys, and observations. Um, so a few examples here down below. Users cannot find their desired items on our site because they were confused about our menus. Then that also begs another question, why? Why are they confused about our menus? What are they confused about? Um, so one user went back and forth between two categories expecting to find it in either of those two. So that means you probably have um, a set of menus that have conflicting or overlapping uh, meanings. Um, and that makes it ambiguous for your users. And now they keep on clicking and trying out every single menu item until they find the thing that they're looking for. And so this contributes to that, um, to that delay um, and a struggle people face when they're using your site. So that's the difference between qualitative and quantitative UX research techniques. I'm gonna provide some more examples in the next few slides, but I wanna also talk about attitudinal versus behavioral UX research. And this is simply the difference between what users say and what they actually do. Um, could you rely on what users say all the time? Probably not, because what they say may not, ne may not necessarily be or match what they actually do on your site. For instance, they would, they would say, I would probably um, need, I would need um, appliance parts every two months. Um, that's from based on my experience. Um, but then if, if you track them, their, their logins to your site, you would see, you know, probably more than that or, or less than that. Um, so this is where you, this is why you need to pair attitudinal versus behavioral um, 
behavioral data, which is just seeing and observing what users do on your site. On the flip side, can you rely only on behavioral information? Let's say you did see some people on your site clicking furiously on the different menu items while they're trying to, to, to find their item. You see what they're doing. You see that they are confused. But what is it that they are confused about? Mere observation wouldn't be able to give you that insight. So you also need to pair that with what they say. You also, if you can, you can ask them what's confusing them. Why do you think, um, why do you think, for, for example, um, somebody's buying a cell phone, and probably you have menu items like electronics and gadgets. So cell phones can be in any one of those two menus, essentially, but where is it really? So without asking users what they're confused about, um, behavioral, um, research is simply just not sufficient on its own. You, you want to have a good mix of both. And so that's why I say using a mixed methods approach to research gives you a greater diversity of data. Not only do you have um, numbers, but you also have spoken insights. Not only do you have uh, not only do you have uh, behavioral or observations, but you also have what they say or spoken, um, yeah, like I said, spoken insights. I practically just coined this, this statement a few hours ago, so you better believe it. <laughs> um, so this is one of the um, approaches that I use in my work as well. I try to combine many different approaches in my research try to, to get qualitative, quantitative, attitudinal, and behavioral data and find different insights that way. All right, so I'm going to present some exploratory UX research techniques. So what you see here is um, just a sample of what's out there. Um, you could do surveys, interviews, and what's called as contextual inquiry. So doing surveys, you can do that online or on, in person. Um, what I like to do is um, sometimes I use pop-up surveys to really catch, um, catch the user when they're doing a certain action to say, if they click this button, I, will, I would want to ask a certain question. Why are they clicking it? Why, what's their expectation? Um, what do they expect to find if they click on that button? Um, so some on-site surveys, you can also do some of that. Um, you can also do interviews online or in person. And you can also call, call them if you can't um, invite them over. And contextual inquiry is practically just doing your surveys, doing your interviews um, in the presence of the, the user in the actual environment of use. For instance, you're, you're designing a product for teachers. So you might want to go to them, go to the schools, and interview them while they're, while they're there on the job. That gives you richer responses, because then the context applies during your interview. Um, so your respondent will be in the right phase of mind um, so there would be, you know, students chatting, you, you, her fellow, um, their fellow teachers. So if everything is in context in the right environments, that should give you richer insights. There's also other techniques, and there's uh, something called card sorting, um, and this is something you, you could use when you're trying to construct your information architecture or your menu navigation. Um, there's, more, uh, there's more definitions on this on the link, by the way, on the left. Um, so if you guys want to follow that link, that's going to give you more videos, more examples of these different techniques that I'm presenting right now. 
Card sorting um, on a nutshell is when you ask users to arrange and sort some cards, and these cards represent your menus. And you, you want to say, hey, where does uh, this particular item fall under? So as opposed to creating your own arrangements, you want to see how your users actually want to arrange them. There's also things, uh, sorry, there's, there's also something called a diary study. And that is when you ask users to uh, note and write down what they're experiencing, what they're thinking on, on separate times of the day or when they're doing a particular activity. So um, sometimes there, there's pros and cons to, to all of these methods, um, but these are essentially good ways to sort of get insights into their lives without, having, without being too intrusive. Um, so you can also do this remotely. You can, you can ask to send them emails. Uh, you, you can, sorry, you can send them emails when it's time to, to answer, or you can have them um, register whatever they're thinking by themselves. That's also fine. You can also use session recordings, and this is a good way to uncover um, some opportunities. So session recordings are basically just recorded sessions on your site. So let's say you want to record people who who land on your main page, on your home page. You might want to record people who click on this button and see what they're doing next. So these are technique, uh, this is a, te a technique that can sort of give you that insight into their journey through your site. And that brings me to the bottom right item, journey mapping. And that's how you construct a roadmap of that person's journey through your site. Where does he start? Where does he end? What page does he exit the site? Um, heat maps, that's one thing that you could also use that basically just tells you uh, which elements, which buttons in your site users are clicking the most. Um, so if, if something is clicked most uh, more often, they appear red on the heat map. And if they're um, not, clicked as often, they appear gray. So that gives an insight into uh, whether users are clicking the buttons that they should be clicking or whether they're clicking on something else. And finally, user analytics. Um, and this is something you can, you, know, you can rely on third party software like Google Analytics um, to give you sort of that metrics um, like times on task, session times. Um, you can also even know um, which states or which countries your 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 customer your users are visiting from, and then now you know, you know how, you know what their mind is like or what their culture is like when they're using your product. That gives you a, a wealth of information. Once again, uh, more info on all of these techniques on the link on the lower left. Um, this, this is just uh, a snapshot of what's available. Um, there's awesome videos you can find on usability.gov. That's one of my primary resources as well um, when trying to decide what method to use when. Um, and finally, this is my last slide before I open it up to questions. So here are some practical tips um, for those of you who aspire to become UX researchers um, who, are, who are already doing some form of research currently in their company, but would want to refine that. So you want to be specific with your research questions, right? You want to make sure they are measurable. So what it is really that you want to find out. Um, so let's say I want to examine why, um, why people are leaving the cart, right? So we have to stick and focus on that question to give you that scope. And hopefully you can find and uh, gather your data that's all accurate so that you can answer that question. Just be specific. Um, sometimes what I do, like for one research project, like one research project has one research question, 
Um, in that that way, I don't overcomplicate it. I don't scope creep it. Um, everything I do from now on will all just answer that that one single question. So that ha that has helped me so far in um, you know just saving time and, and saving effort. Uh, the next one is to be practical. Just be practical. It's something I also do myself. Research doesn't have to be expensive and complicated. If you don't have the budget, doesn't mean you can't do research. You still can. You just need to be creative. There's a bunch of free tools out there that don't require any subscriptions and memberships, and those are things that you should take advantage of. And don't overcomplicate your research. Sometimes people think that research is tedious, that it's laborious, that it takes time. And when your stakeholders and upper management think this way, you're going to be in a bad, in a bad spot. Um, you want to be able to convince them that research is something you can do quickly um, throughout the development cycle uh, quickly and without much cost. So next is you want to, you don't want to ask leading questions. And what do I mean by this? So when you create your surveys, when you create your interview questions, you might be tempted to just, because you're so focused on your question that you just want to ask that question outright. For instance, you might be tempted to ask the question, do you like this old version or this improved version? Right, so what is the, um, what is the, uh, the downside there? When, when people hear that there's an old versus a new, obviously that gives them an idea that they should pick the improved one because it's improved, because why not? But then you're now leading them to pick one option versus another. It is very important in asking, oh, when you ask your questions, that you keep it open-ended, that you allow the user to choose both, um, that you allow equal opportunity for your respondents to choose either options, right? So another example would be, do you find this new layout confusing? So while that could obviously answer your question right away, yes or no, um, but some people don't actually, so some people who, are, who don't see your site to be confusing will now become tempted to think of things that are confusing on their site just to satisfy, um, satisfy your question, right? So you might instead want to ask, um, how do you find this new layout? Or in the first question that I asked, which version do you prefer? So you might you you, you want to keep that safe um, and give equal opportunity for people to choose um, all the all the uh, all the options and not just one. The fourth one is support your recommendations with research data. Um, in times when you can't do UX research necessarily because you, you lack time and you don't have data to support your recommendations, you can still get some data by obviously looking at your competitors or looking at existing research from other companies, looking at best practices. Um, so these are still things that you can use to support your recommendations. And the emphasis here is to always have something to bolster your recommendations, because otherwise, people, your, you know, people will just think they, these are your your own opinions. So sometimes, um, in, in my experience, in cases where I could not do some research and where they, um, the stakeholders need quick decisions, um, that I would just go to a a journal article or a um, a best practice um, best practice or expert advice that I that I find and um, if that makes sense to them that should be enough to to support your recommendations 
Um, the fifth one is to build rapport with your stakeholders. And to me, this is very critical um, because if you don't build that positive relationship with your stakeholders, you'd have some frictions. Uh, you'd have some friction when you, you know, when you deliver your findings, they might be um, a little uh, against it. They're averse to it. They're more resistant to it. But uh, when you sort of build that rapport with your stakeholders, you now know how to phrase that finding in a way that makes sense to them. And also you want to build rapport with your stakeholders so that everybody in the organization builds that empathy for your users. Um, um, empathy for users doesn't have to rest on the shoulders of UX practitioners alone. It has to be shared by people in the organization so that everybody, when in whatever uh, job that they do every day, they have their users, they have the users in mind. And finally, stay curious. Um, as a researcher, curiosity is paramount. You can you cannot be a researcher if you are not curious. Simply put, um, and just practice, practice. You might um, make some mistakes at first, um, but the the more times you do it, the more you refine your craft, your skill, and your craft. And most importantly, believe that you can do it. Research doesn't have to be very hard, and it doesn't have to be exclusive. Uh, to certain people with certain abilities, everybody can do it. Everybody can, you know, put their users first when making decisions in the company. And ultimately, when users are happy, the, the whole company is happy because then you, you can have more profit and more loyalty, more customer attention. And when the users are happy, the business is happy. So I'm going to stop there and um, answer some Q&A. And while I'm answering that, here are some um, thoughts from, from leaders in tech that you can stare at while I'm answering some questions. Um, I'm now, unfortunately, have to stop my screen share so I can look at your comments on Twitch. Just give me a sec. All right, do, does anybody have any questions? I am on the Twitch um, Twitch screen now, so I can answer some questions. Don't ask leading questions, same as in Mokaun Kabai. Don't ask just for fun. <laughs> yeah, it's a... Uh, and there's one other comment here. The key to be a good designer is curiosity and practice. That's for sure. Very well explained. Thank you. I hope you guys find it insightful. OK, here's a question from Hippie B Universe. Do you conduct your own surveys to customers? Yes, I do. Um, what I do is I compose my surveys and have it reviewed by um, the team lead or the manager or uh, the team who's requesting for that research, make sure everything is covered. Um, ultimately, the, the findings will be thrown to them, so I want to make sure that I cover everything when I conduct and compose my own surveys. Okay, here's another question from, say, Jacob B. Is being a UX researcher more of a consultant rather than being an actual designer? Hmm, good question. Um, in some companies, particularly the, um, the smaller sized companies, you are most likely going to be the only UX person, so you might want to you might be tasked to do both research and design. 
Um, but I wouldn't say a researcher is like more of a consultant than an actual designer, because as a researcher, you can actually also influence the design. So in, in, that, in saying that, you're actually also a designer. Um, I've been in roles where I am a dedicated researcher in the company. Um, so that allowed me to really flex my research muscles, um, conduct surveys while another team focuses on making the design. Um, but I'd say that these two roles need to work hand in hand, um, obviously, as the research findings will be used by the designers. All right, here's a question from Lenser. How often do you use behavioral theories in your research to analyze data? If so, what do you commonly use? Right, so behavioral theories. There's a bunch of theories, actually. Um, for uh, something I could think at the top of my head, um, right now, it's just um, this. There, I, I kind of forgot the actual name of the law, but then it states when you when you offer a lot of options, um, the user will have more time to decide on on the options. Whereas if you reduce the numbers, uh, the number of options, and make it simpler for them, they're more likely to to arrive at a decision faster. Um, so that's one thing, uh, one of the theories that I've tried to sort of justify, um, you know, why we need to reduce some, um, some, okay, here's a, here's an example. Um, we've been offering so many different shipping, um, shipping options like express shipping or regular shipping. Express is like same day or two days, regular shipping takes three to five days. Um, it used to be more than that um there used to be more it, it used to be more tiered more hierarchical but then if when we offered that we, we saw that it takes people more time to decide and sometimes it's um it's just plain confusing so we, we decided to reduce some of the options um, and make it easier for them to decide all right here's another question from kristen finity May I ask some of your experiences as a UX researcher? Uh, okay, so I'd like to understand the question more. What sort of experiences do you want me to talk about? So if you can just follow that up on the comments, I'd like to know what specific things you want to ask about in my experience. Um, while you're doing that, I can move on to the next question. What's the most common or usual UX exploratory techniques do I use? I use surveys and um, screen recordings and um, heat maps. Those are the common things because um, we have a subscription to Hotjar, and that essentially is a software that allows you to do that. Okay, V. Mutaya. Is UAT part of UXR or UXR is done after go live? So um, depending on the type of research that you're doing, some of the research is better done before any design is completed. And some of the research is best done after, um, uh, after implementation or after go live. Um, UAT stands for, I think, user acceptance testing. Right, so I think UAT would be part of the testing phase in the software development cycle. This is also where you can analyze, you know, how might the user experience this? What might he think of it? So to answer your question, there's, um, um, there's plenty of ways, and, and I talked about this too earlier, is um, there's, you can actually do research throughout the software development cycle, but it's more critical to do research before design and um, after deployment. All right, um, another one from Lee Boy. What's the most common problem or obstacle you encountered when doing surveys? 
uh, let me think about that for a sec. The, the common challenge I think would have to be how you compose the question. Um, one thing, one thing to remember, and I talked about this too, is you want to avoid leading questions, but at the same time, um, you want to really get to the bottom of what you're trying to know. So I guess a challenge would be to strike the balance between not leading your users and just, you know, uncovering the data that you need. So that has been, and, and this takes practice too. I can't really say how I do it because it differs in every single question that I that I make. Um, but that's definitely the biggest challenge as to how do you compose your question. Um, sometimes and you also have to assume a tone and I think that helps. Uh, you can start with you can be you can sound professional with your question or you can be you can sound youthful depending on the brand like hey we want to get a couple of minutes of your time to answer some questions you can start with that um, and people will respond differently to whatever approach you take all right bupu dop says starting a ux research for your idea always feels overwhelming how do you know where to start and overcome the feeling of being overwhelmed. Um, sometimes I think if you, if you feel overwhelmed, it always is helpful to just focus on one question at a time, because there you could have a bunch of questions that you want to answer. Um, what I found that was helpful was you just choose the top question that you or your stakeholders want to know uh, because it, it's critical to them. Like for, for my case, um, everybody wants to know why people are abandoning their cards. Um, so it will feel less overwhelming that way if you reduce the scope of your research. Um, and and when, once that's done, you can, do, you can always do a follow-up research um, to answer some some of your other questions. So it doesn't have to be performed or answered all at the same time, because that, that would be time consuming and a lot of effort and definitely overwhelming. All right, Nicole Express says, is, user, is UX research somewhat similar to data science or analytics? Uh, whew. Data science. <laughs> Uh, yes and no, I'd say. Um, they are similar in, in the sense that they look at user data and analytics, but the treatment for, for UX research, there, there's, there's more to just staring at data, um, right? You could also want to uncover some qualitative aspects as well, which is something that data scientists and analytics could not tell you. So I, I guess they differ in that case, but they're both um, similar in the way that they are um, using customer generated or user generated data. Um, say Jacob, what are the challenges of being a UX researcher? Is there a certain course or degree to become a UX researcher? Uh, one of the top challenges I'd say is the um, and this happens a lot when you have your proposals too, and we ha when you have certain ideas, is that there's always going to be some resistance, and um, and some counter counter arguments which you should prepare for. Um, that has been one of um, things that I needed to learn to 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 do and how to deliver my findings in a way that's credible and believable. And once once people see that it's backed by data, it's backed by research, they're less likely to question it anyway. Is there a certain course or degree? Um, I started my career um, six or five years back at a time where there's essentially no UX degrees available, especially in Cebu or in the Philippines. Um, however, now, um, if you, do a Google search, you'll find some options 
like degrees in human computer interaction, even degrees in user experience design. So there's plenty of more options now. Um, or you could also enroll to the courses in SF Tech. That's what I say. <laughs> um, but ultimately, there's really no, I'd say, not really a um, clear cut degree to, to do to guarantee you a spot in the UX research world. Um, everybody comes into UX coming from different backgrounds, and that diversity obviously um, helps in, 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 in making decisions, design decisions, coming from varied perspectives. All right, so here's a concrete kitchen from Kristen. Any interesting stories that involved your work as a UX researcher? Huh, there's a lot of stories. Um, I could probably think of one, but um, in the interest of time, I could probably answer, since I could go on and on if I talk about my story, um, I could probably answer that um, on Discord too, and then everybody can just chime in and ask follow-up questions there as well. Um, right now, if that's all right, I'm going to move on to the other questions, and hopefully I could answer that in time. What are some of the biggest trends in the UX design industry? I would say there's a big shift to mobile. Um, that has become a rising trend. Um, more and more people are using their phones now than before, and more and more people have access to, to to smartphones now than before. So that is a big trend because um, obviously a mobile experience is designed differently than a desktop experience because of your uh, uh, reduced screen size. So that's probably one of the, the biggest trends that I can think of right now. So here's a question from Ace Marie. I think there are, oh. OK, so this is a question, ah, sorry, an answer, a response to say Jacob. Human factors engineering, interaction design, cognitive, yep, those are definitely available in the market right now. So I think I have uh, five more questions. Is proper UX research a luxury reserved for bigger businesses? I'd say no. and, and Definitely UX research shouldn't be um, thought of internally as a luxury or a nice to have. Um, there needs to be a bigger push for UX research to be a must have um, in, in, in all organizations, um, whether big or small. We are a small organization now and I am the first ever UX researcher in this, in this company. Um, but in my previous jobs, I've also, I, um, I was part of a larger UX research team. So I'd say, just to answer your question, um, bigger businesses can afford to have bigger teams just because their products are much more massive and they have a bigger customer base. Um, but that doesn't, that doesn't necessarily mean that smaller businesses can't have that. They could probably get one your ex researcher like like me now um, in in this company, but um, yeah, there needs to be a bigger push that it doesn't have it that it's not a must uh, that's not a nice to have, but it's a must have. All right, so um, here's a question from Ace Marie. Before deploying the survey question, do we follow the conventional preliminary test like validation, reliability, and expert opinion? Yeah, I think I uh, alluded to this a little bit. Um, I do um, like have somebody proofread uh, the questions that I that I my my survey questionnaire. Um, make sure everything is covered. Um, you know what they want to know. I could answer by my survey. So I think that's what you mean by your preliminary test. Validation, reliability, and expert opinion. Yeah. If I'm anyway not answering any of your questions, just please um, give me a shout out on Discord and I'd be happy to expound. 
Jewel says, which is easier to do, qualitative or quantitative research? When do you need to conduct a survey with time, with limited time allotted? Which is easier, qualitative or quantitative? I wouldn't say one is easier. I think they're equally, um, they equally deserve the same attention um, and the same effort. Um, when you try to choose what metrics you want you want to use in a quantitative research, it's just as important as when you compose your questions for a qualitative survey. Um, yeah, so I wouldn't I wouldn't think there's an easier one, but uh, but you definitely want to do both if you can. When you need to conduct a survey with limited. Oh, so that was a. Hmm, that was a question based on the earlier phrase. Qualitative versus quantitative when you need to conduct a survey. You could it's uh, it's faster. I'd say that it's faster to do a survey than to do a quantitative research simply because you with quantitative research, you you'd need higher sample sizes um, than you do with qualitative research. So it's faster, but I wouldn't say um, one is easier than the other. Just one is faster. Yeah, surveys would be something you could do quickly um, when you are short on time. All right. What is the usual setting or workday in your work as a UX researcher? Basically, I'm just interested in your line of work. Yep, uh, my typical day and as a UX researcher would be um, to talk to the stakeholders to see if they have anything that needs research. Um, also, just try to use the website and, and, and uncover usability issues of my own. Um, I could also work on previously launched surveys and see if the responses have come in. Um, just monitor that. That's, um, that's yeah, that's essentially my day-to-day -day work, just to monitor the research that's, that's going on, that's um, the data gathering uh, that's going on. So just want to monitor that. Um, and yeah, sometimes you make presentations um, and uh, talk to people inside the company and see how they're like. <laughs> it's just uh, pretty typical, I'd say. Bun talks. How do you identify UX trends and when conducting any type of research, how would you identify the user's needs versus the user's wants? Good question. How do you identify UX trends? Um, you can see that if you look at, um, if you follow tech news at all or innovation news, um, if you attend conferences, there are some, some discussions on the trends or where UX design, how it's evolving, where it's going. So you can participate um, in that. Um, some trends you can uncover from doing UX research, absolutely, um, and by analytics. Um, in, in, especially in that case, in, in, in the mobile design example, that's something you can actually get from your, from your UX research and, say, and, and from your analytics and see what sort of devices they're using your website on. Um, so there's plenty of sources of trends that you can, you can find. How do you identify the user's needs versus the user's wants? Okay, I don't, it's a very interesting question. Um, I don't. I don't really discriminate between a need and a want. Um, my um, my approach would be if something is said by the user that I'd, I'd try that I would try to somehow cater to that as much as I can. Um, if that specific thing is constantly being repeated by 
a lot of other users, then you can probably see a trend there that you could probably see that it's a common, um, it's, a, it's, it's a shared necessity or it's a shared insight. Um, but I, I wouldn't, okay, let me rephrase that, that response. So I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't look at it probably as a needs versus wants thing. I would look at how many people are saying this versus how many people are saying that. Um, so if based on your surveys, this certain insight came up 10 times more than this other, and this other um, this other insight, then you obviously want to get uh, give more attention to that more prominent response. Okay, so I'm going to answer the final two questions here, and then if you have guys have more questions, feel free to post them on Discord uh, in the UX Research Channel. So say Jacob says, how is the UX or design industry in other countries different here in the Philippines? Um, so I, I, um, I'd say it, it's practically just the same, except that the community, um, I'd, the community, the UX community is more uh, vibrant here since UX has been around for longer than it has been in the Philippines. Um, so it's more vibrant. There's more people practicing UX. You can meet more people doing UX if you do a quick LinkedIn search. Um, there's just more people to meet in UX than I think in the Philippines. But essentially, the line of work is practically just the same. Yeah. All right, finally, why is UI UX commonly merged into one position? Hmm. Because the, the short answer would be because the company is short on resources, I think. But that's, uh, that's something common, and I'm not, not going to blame that. I'm not, not, not going to blame them for it. But um, this, is, this is a whole debate in itself. You know why people some why some companies have UI and UX merged into one position, and why some companies have more dedicated positions. Um, but short answer is, if they can afford more people, then why not? If they can, then you got one position. But at least there's somebody looking after UX, and that's that's what matters. All right, I think I've covered all the questions. Um, Again, if you haven't signed the yeah. attendance form, please feel free to, to, to sign, sign up there. And if you have more questions, just uh, reach out to me on Discord. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, this was amazing. Thank you so much, Charles. Uh, it was really fantastic. We'll be posting it online. Please join us on Discord. We love you, Sabu. Hang in there during COVID. And um, uh, the other thing is don't uh, have a great week and don't forget to join us again next week where we'll be having uh, the other two uh, lectures. So hopefully the audio is okay. And uh, thank you guys so much. All right, guys. Take See care. you again have next Sunday. Week. Bye. Bye. Saturday and Sunday, everybody. Saturday and Sunday. Saturday is, is Sir Aaron and then Sunday is Mr. Charles again. So. There you go. Thanks a lot, guys. Stay healthy. Have a great week.